Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well. My name is Shweta and welcome to yet another episode of a LinkedIn Live series, Lookboard Perspectives. Today we have with us Sally Eves, Chair of Global Cyber Trust. Hi Sally. Hi, lovely to join you today. So, so lovely Sally, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, all good. I'm, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. It's a great topic area. Mm. Me too, I'm really excited. So folks, if you actually go through Sally's LinkedIn profile, you'll find that there is a long list of experiences. In fact, 19. Yes, you can actually see that I counted them. And I mean, 19, right? And every single one of them, every single experience that she's been a part of is either a prestigious organization or really impactful initiatives. And it's truly inspiring to see how each and every organization or uh, in, in, uh, initiative she's been a part of has been so powerful. And Sally, I mean, really, how have you done it? How has the journey been so far? And Maybe I wouldn't be able to do justice to what you've done. So could you just give us an insight into how your tech journey has been so far? Oh, thank you. Firstly, thank you so much. That's a lovely introduction. I really, really appreciate it. And and, and lovely to, to meet you all with the audience as well today. Um, I'd kind of say I work across different areas. So for me, I like to talk in pillars. So I would say emergent technology, pillar one, pillar two, education, and pillar three, social impact but all equally weighted and one helps another. So my background, as, as you kind of alluding to, I've done very hands-on tech roles from, you know, from some system support to change manager um, to CTO level as well. And now I do mostly advisory around different forms of technology and how they integrate together. I'm very passionate about education. My nonprofit is in that space. Um, and it also focuses on things like diversion and inclusion and sustainability. And I also work in developing new research. Um, so I have that kind of hat as well, really understanding that behavior and expectation change and the culture and the skills implications of technology too. So yeah, all those elements definitely fit together. Um, I really, really enjoy that. And some of my current roles are Chair of Global Cyber Trust at the Global Foundation of Cyber Studies. I'm CEO of Tomorrow's Tech Today and Aspirational Futures, my non-for-profit, plus a lot of work with universities and in the non-profit space and NGOs. Wow, wow. Mad respect, Sally. What you've done is truly amazing. So you've been in the tech industry for quite some time now, right? Where exactly does Locode fit in this landscape? Yeah, I'm super excited about the trajectory with low code. I think it's fantastic. And for me, the biggest fit area is really making application development accessible to everyone. So that key word for me is democratization, I would say, and accessibility. You know, whether you're a professional developer or a citizen developer, we've got a big rise in that at the moment, which is fantastic to see. It really is supporting that advance of innovation, um, alignment across IT and business and also shared culture as well. So for me, I mean, even the name, doesn't it, low code, it's implying software that you don't need prior knowledge of coding to be able to deliver. So it's really exciting. So if you've got that right set of low code tools or no code tools, even in your in your toolbox, you can do so much and more people can be involved across lines of business, for example, it can be so much closer to the business problem in many respects. So it really is allowing you to build apps that are properly tailored to your needs without writing a single line of code. So it really is exciting. And again, the key word for me, democratization. Democratization, yes. Making everyone um, democratic, making application development accessible to everyone, right? Absolutely. So what uh, are the, you know, what do you think is a key benefit of, let's say, businesses or even an individual adopting um, a technology like low code? Lots of benefits, I would say, first of all. I mean, I think the key one is the fact that when you've got a low code platform, you're using visual development. So you're not using you know, traditional lines of code, for example. So the direct benefit of that is flexibility and the ability to be uniquely fast, basically, in terms of your development. So I really think that the key benefit of low code is getting business value quickly. And you can make, for example, ready market changes like product adjustments, for example, in a very short space of time. So you're accelerating that curve for innovation and also new product development and new model development as well for business. So I think, you know, if I put them in the round of kind of a suite of benefits or a wheel of benefits, I would say faster development, flexibility, higher productivity, um, cost efficiencies as well. That's definitely right up there. The streamlining of business processes is super important today. 
definitely improving user experience. And that's also, you know, end user from the employee perspective, but ultimately the end user, you know, from a consumer perspective about what is actually built. Um, improved time to market, so really enabling that agile innovation that's such an imperative today. And finally, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, supporting the rise of citizen developers, you know, at the line of business, which I think is absolutely key to optimize innovation going forward. So yeah, really exciting this trajectory. So there's one thing that I observed, right? The rise of citizen developers or supporting citizen developers, um, getting them involved more in tech. Uh, do you think um, maybe the traditional developers might take it as a threat? Do you think they consider low code as, you know, hey, then what about us? Do you think there's a, the kind of a conversation that floats around? I think it has been, um, but I think increasingly it's less of a concern. Um, certainly the professional developers that I've been working with, they see it as an opportunity. It frees up more of their time to focus on you know, really specialized, high granularity, complex coding activities and kind of allows the more everyday pieces to, to, to be done and supported by low code or no code. So I actually see it as a complementary strength. Um, and less of a risk. I think that was there initially, but I think the further we've gone down this route, particularly with things like supply and demand talent gaps around development as well, and a lot of development teams being quite overstretched, I really think most people are seeing it as a complementary asset within your team and your extended team. So, so I think less of a concern going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, low code also em enables a lot of students get into yeah. the world of coding, right? Without Absolutely. actually, yeah. So what's your take on that? I think it's super exciting. I mean, just a few weeks ago, there was an event in Zurich called um, called Hack Zurich, funnily enough. Um, and that was involving lots of student teams. And they were using, um, some were using coding solutions and many for the first time ever um, were getting involved in technology using completely low code solutions as well. And at the end of this 48 hours, um, sorry, 40 hours, they were coming out with solutions, you know, uh, minimum vial products that were all addressing SDG challenges. So social impact challenges, particularly around flood, for example, um, and around like scarcity of water and food, things like that. And it was incredible. And their enthusiasm and excitement, frankly, to see what was possible in such a short period of time, it really showed the power of low code solutions for good in particular. And people were changing their minds really about, oh God, I could really go into that as a career. People who hadn't considered that before and thought, oh, I don't have that right skill set to be able to contribute to that team. It opened their eyes to the art of the possible and how all these different skills make a difference. So it was a massive enabler. And I think it's a huge bridge actually for different types of um, people with different experiences and different skill sets to come together around a common challenge so yes yeah, super exciting and yeah that's a very kind of recent example of that in action very glad that low code is kind of uh, bridging that gap but Definitely. what about the gap between it and businesses what that's a very good one as well. Mind the gap, I think, is, is the expression that's been around for a few years, hasn't it? But I think it definitely has a, a big you know, bridging role. So you know, from an IT perspective, for example, you know, I mentioned it just now, you know, the demand for developers is continuing to, to outpace supply. COVID has affected that too. And also IT teams are managing a lot of complexity, um, often technical debt. You know, trying to balance different needs, balancing code quality, for example, with getting that faster time to market to innovate that I mentioned earlier too. So actually, this can be a really good opportunity to reduce the burden, you know, on technical teams that can often be overworked. Um, and there's been issues of burnout we've seen increasingly reported too. So this is another way to support people better. Um, you know, it really frees up time. Um, it kind of challenges that traditional IT cycle of delivery too, uh, you know, freeing up that developer time to innovate and be more agile. Um, I think also it allows a different focus area. You mentioned again about, you know, benefits for professional developers rather than threats. One would be allowing more time to focus on areas like governance and security. So a huge benefit there. And I think the other thing I would mention too is like accelerating the pace of software development without the need for like particularly large teams, for example, that are focused on a particular technology stream, you know, whether that's say iOS or Android, for example. So, so many benefits there for the IT um, side of things and equally for, you know, for business users too. You know, it's enabling business users um, sometimes for the very first time you know, to build applications, to make changes to process. And they're using this kind of simple logic and drag and drop interfaces basically. So without that prior need for coding skills. So that really excites me because it enables you know, business users who can be super, super close to some of the challenges at hand that tech is trying to address. And it allows them to look at those problems directly. So it's kind of like apps for work, if you, if you know what I mean. That's my kind of phrase for that one. So it allows that building, that monetization of lines of business. And it also reduces risk, you know, building apps, for example, that aren't 
ultimately aligned to business needs. And you know that scope creep that can sometimes happen, that is less likely to happen if you're having business owners and business users right at the heart of that development. So yeah, from both sides, I think it's a huge bridge to use that analogy again. It's a huge difference maker. True, true. I think I've also personally come across many business users who have who probably don't have the you know resources uh, to yes. set up a dedicated you know development team or to get that they they cannot afford that kind of a luxury. But then Absolutely. with low code platforms, you can just as you said you know visual development right drag and drop a couple of things uh, if they know the logic if they know their business in and out it's easier for them to put something outside and the kind of satisfaction. It gives them. Yes. It's, it's truly very inspiring to see for people like us. Absolutely, it's super side. rewarding, isn't it? Definitely, and I think it's closening those relationships across IT and business users. It really is, and it's you know getting things that are designed that are increasingly, increasingly fit for purpose and in a more agile way too. So yeah, multiple benefits all around. I would say. True, true. Jenny, agree to that. So, what do you think would be like the you know, apt use cases for a low code platform. Like, do you think you can build anything on low code, or do you think there are these kind of use cases that's more apt? You know, what is your take on that? What do you think about it? Um, well, definitely multiple applications, I would say, and across multiple sector verticals as well. Um, but like anything, I think there's always use cases that kind of spring to mind as particularly, you know, suitable. Um, so definitely enhancing customer experiences would be would be right up there for me. You know, you have that potential to have the advantage of exceptional UI tools, that capacity to integrate as well into your existing systems and really improve things like satisfaction of consumers, retention and revenue. And I've seen examples of that gain across many sectors, you know, digital banking, patient access, you know, care in healthcare, also things like claims management in the insurance industry as well. And one particular example of that that I've seen work very well using low code is the development of web-based portals they're very cost effective digital tools and they particularly enable self-service um, so it really enhances that experience and it's very cost effective at the same time so i definitely say um, customer experience would probably be my number one in terms of enhance, enhancing things as a use case you know overall underpinning everything you know digital transformation um, so many examples of that you know whether it's internal ops or developing new business and models as well particular example I think is so well suited is a development of IoT enabled apps. You know, I think low code integrates particularly well with IoT platforms and enterprise systems and also third party systems as well. So you can really enable that active intelligence, you know, data being translated into more actionable insights, increasingly real, si real time so that end users can consume them quickly. So I think that is particularly exciting. And again, low code empowering that development really also builds that rich customer experience at the same time. So, yeah, definitely um, I'm seeing examples of that in medicine. For example, you know, temperature mon monitors, that type of thing, and also things like equipment tracking um, and also service issue alerts, things like that. So definitely IoT enabled apps, apps sorry, um, and also things like native mobile apps too and progressive web app development. So, so many use cases there, I would say. I think as the examples show, a lot of diversity about where you can apply them as a sector as well. Um, I'd also love to say, you know, looking ahead a bit further too. Now, I saw some research recently um, by Gartner, and it was saying, I think that 70% of new applications developed by enterprises will use or they're embed low-code or no-code technology by 2025. Wow. So that's really exciting, particularly if you look back, because I checked their research um, from 2020, and the level there was only 20%. So it really shows that rate of adoption and interest and growth in the sector. And I think we're only going to go further. You know, I see a great use case around hyper-automation, um, and that hyper intelligence. So it's bringing together things like low code um, to really support intelligent automation. So kind of pairing it in many ways with things like BPM, um, AI and machine learning type technologies, and in particular things like natural language processing, um, optimal character recognition, and things like conversational AI and the bots that we, we're all quite familiar with these days. So for me, that's the next level of use case. It's kind of this age of convergence, the different technologies coming together, but with low code being kind of that linchpin that underpinning um, factor that really is that enablement to make it reality. So yeah, I think it's a very exciting times. So low code is definitely not just another buzzword. It's a serious thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's serious. It's tangible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Right. So how do we get started with low code platforms then, Sally? What would be your, let's say, you know, tips or suggestions to get started with it? 
Uh, that's a great question as well. So I think, you know, if you're starting on the journey to low code right now, um, firstly, I always say, look at the problem that, that you're looking at. Yeah, it's, it's never about always the latest technology. It's making sure you've got the fit to what you're looking to do. So look for a platform that's truly looking at the needs that you have. So identify those needs first. Choose something that reduces complexity. So you want a simple tool that will help to onboard your staff more quickly and to get that buy in. Um, but also just make sure you know who your audience is. That's super important when you're tailoring a solution that best fits what your needs are. Um, and also, also making sure that the data, whether it's company or consumer or employee, is secure within that process. So you've got fundamentals to, to, to get started. And also as part of that, you take an audit of where you are from a tech estate point of view, but also a skills audit in your organization too. So that you need that benchmark foundation of where to start. Secondly, I would say find a community. Uh, community is so, so powerful when it comes to development, but when it comes to all sorts of different things, to be honest with you. And I think with Zoho in particular, I've been super impressed with the power of your community. You know, things like Developer Day, that campaign I think is amazing, but also the fact you've got things like the free community edition as well. I think that's super helpful. You've got a kind of specific community for, for developers, but also for other stakeholders too. So look for those communities. You've got so much free resources, knowledge sharing going on. And I think, you know, you'll find someone there. If you, if you encounter a problem, you're bound to find someone who's already experienced it and will be very willing to share and very quickly too. You know, I, I, I do mentoring in platforms and, and communities like that. And I think they're really great. Also look at things like social media. I think it's sometimes underrated for finding kind of communities of practice and people who are interested in the same areas as you. So I do a lot on there you know, about development, development for good, you know, um, AI and automation for good, sharing use cases, et cetera. That can be a great learning and mentoring opportunity too. And again, check out those resources. There are so many case studies so you can tailor it to your particular sector and interest and you know, learn from other people who have been through these processes too. And developer communities in particular are so good for open sharing. So I'd highly recommend that as part of your starting point too. You know, find peers and mentors to support you. So you'll have to first ensure that your problem statement is sorted. You also yes. have to choose your audience rightly, ensure yes. that the data is secure, audit the skills of your team in terms of the technical expertise, and most importantly, to find a community that has great knowledge sharing. So these are your tips and tricks to get started with the local platform. Absolutely. Well said. Great summary. Thank you. <laughs> right. So what else do you think, uh, Sally, can one do with local platforms? I mean, of course, we can build applications, you know, drag and drop, uh, integrate an IoT. What is an additional advantage or what is that edge? What is that one reason why people should be, you know, choosing local platforms? Just if you have to pick one reason. Oh, I, I think I might go back to a phrase I used earlier on about accelerating the innovation curve. You know, we live at a time where the scale, the scope, the speed of change, frankly, has, has never been faster. Um, and I also think we're in a, a kind of tipping point moment. I don't use that phrase very often, but I'll use it this time in terms of what we can achieve through technology. We've never had such a resonance, I think, across business and society coming together and showing that you can create shared value. So you can innovate for, for your business and equally you can deliver impact for community, you know, around the sustainable development goals in particular, you know, things like sustainability and inclusion. For me, low code is one of these bridging factors that accelerates innovation on both. It allows us to couple that impact together. So that's why I'm so excited and so passionate about what it, what it does, because it enables so many more people to be part of that. And it takes down some of the barriers to access that have been there in the past. So we can innovate for shared value. We can do it quickly. We can do it safely and securely. And we can do it with passion, you know, to deliver amazing projects that are great innovation. For, you know, for, it could be entertainment, it could be retail, it could be health. But equally, it can be for that social impact opportunity, too. So, yeah, I think the trajectory here is really bright and it's very inclusive and collaborative. True, true. Your passion is truly infectious and we hope more people adopt local platforms. They explore, they check what it can do for their business or their you know, personal um, initiatives. So thank you so much, Sally, for being a part of this conversation. Uh, for people who would like to know more about local platforms or creator in general, please do visit zocreator.com. And we will continue doing these series and see you all soon, uh, very soon again. Thank you so much, Sally. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.